All right, so today I'm talking about phylogenetics in the cloud. Um, one thing to note, so your instructors are all volunteering to teach you because they want you to learn. So if I'm speaking too quickly, you don't understand, let me know. If there's, a t if there's jargon I use that you don't understand, let me know. Okay? Please interrupt me. This is intended to help you. Okay? So if it's not helping you, stop, and I'll make it help you. Okay? <coughs> we'll get to this cartoon in a minute. Maybe some of you have already seen this. Okay. And for those watching at home, you can go here and get the slides, and you can also get all the links to the resources we're talking about today. So our learning objectives for this section, okay? So briefly understand what phylogenetics is and its utility for life scientists. Right? We're all life scientists, we study life, life's related by a tree. We need to get that tree for lots of things. So we'll talk about what, why it's cool, why it's interesting. Then we'll talk about some of the computational pitfalls. Okay? So I know, you know what can go wrong, what's hard in this domain, why we need to use the cloud. Um, talk about some of the available resources. Okay? And then I also want you to become okay with being a user. Right? So I develop code, you develop code, we know how to now run instances on Amazon. Right? So we're like, you know, we're going to be the ones to do this, which is great. Right? But at some point you're like, okay, I don't have to build my laptop from scratch, I can just use it. I don't have to build my own cloud, I can use Amazon's. Right? So for a lot of these things, there's already good resources available online that you can use. And you find a hole, you can improve it. Right? Right? Um, but in general, for your cloud, you know, there's lots of cloud resources you can use already. So any questions about any of that? Okay, so first of all, phylogenetics is a domain, right? So I spend my life doing this stuff. Like I could be curing cancer, you know, I could be playing baseball or something, but no, I am building and using trees and methods. So why is that? So here's what some of the first stuff I did with trees. Right? So here <coughs> is a bark beetle, a cute little beetle. Okay. And these make galleries in trees, okay, the actual like physical tree tree you can cut down. Right, with tunnels, and <coughs> these tunnels become filled with fungus, and the larvae actually eat the fungus. Okay. And the question is, you know, is this sort of farming? How has it evolved? What does it lead to? Okay. So I can do a lot of stuff by going out in nature and looking at this stuff. But if I go and add a little bit of sequence data, I can build a tree and find out much more. Okay. <coughs> so once I get a tree, I, so here's my phylogeny of these beetles. Okay, this is just a tiny sample of diversity. Okay. But even so, I can use this to understand lots of things. Okay. So, for example, I can plot on what they eat, okay, which, which kind of trees they're in. So you can see, okay, all these are in conifers. Um, this one is actually eating the fungus, not the conifer. And you can look at how often that, that has changed over the tree. So this is stuff happening tens of millions of years ago that now we can infer from just this basic data. Okay, I can reconstruct changes on this tree. <coughs> and so agriculture in these beetles occurred seven times. So some of these beetles, the females, have little pockets, and they stuff their pockets with hyphae, you know, little, bits of, little bits of fungi, fungi and when they fly a new, new, new gallery, they dig a hole, start going, and the fungi can start growing. Okay? It's like bringing a pack of seeds with you on your covered wagon on Oregon Trail. Right? <coughs> and so this has happened seven times, the seven times origin of farming. Right? It was better than humans. Right? We were we need farming, you know, five times maybe. Okay? We can look at diversity. <coughs> so the beetles that feed on angiosperms are much more diverse than their sister groups that feed on conifers. Right? So the sister group is, is we have a speciation event, and one group involves conifer feeding, and one group involves angiosperm feeding. It's like a twin study. And you find many all these cases, you're much more diverse feeding on conifers. So is it because you have a faster speciation rate when you're right, fast, f more diverse on angiosperms? So is it because you have a faster speciation rate when you're in angiosperms, a lower extinction rate when you're in angiosperms? We can investigate that. We can get at that information using a tree. <coughs> we can also look at inbreeding. So some of these have sort of regular looking females, and the males are these weird larval, larval form things that have these giant jaws, and they have a very weird sex ratio. And what it is is the males will impregnate their sisters and then go to the neighboring gallery, fight off their brother, and try to impregnate them too. There's this weird system. We can see, oh, does it correlate with farming? Huh. Farming leads to inbreeding. Right? And start thinking about 
why that strategy might evolve. <laughs> okay, so we can get uh, all these questions from just basic natural history and a phylogeny and the right methods. Any questions about that? So because phylogenetics is so cool, here's a reply I made a few years ago, here we see a number of papers with phylogenetics shooting off, okay? And actually phylogen star, okay? So it's growing through time. And we also see the overlap in fields. So <coughs> at first, phylogenetics starts off as a pimple in the side of evolution, right? Look, look in the journals. And it's becoming much more common across the ecology and evolution. Okay, so it's a big, big growing field. <coughs> what else can you do with it? What you can do in special state reconstruction. Here we have a case where this sort of shows how frogs call. Ew, ew. Okay, different frog calls. And we can reconstruct that down the tree and then figure out, you know, what did this long ago extinct frog sound like? And then play it back to current frogs. And so Ryan Rand did this <coughs> and found that you know, that frog up there would respond <coughs> to its ancestor, but it doesn't respond to its sister at all. But will respond to this one way down here. So separated by this one from, a, from many, many millions of years, but it still responds to the call. Where the sister species is like, you're not sexy to me, right? Which could be some sort of character displacement, right? If you, if you mate with your sister species, maybe you have some weird genetic issues, so you start have being selected against this, this interbreeding, right? You can figure out how this happens, actually, you know, reconstruct an extinct calls using phylogenies. <coughs> if you care about molecular evolution, right? So H5N1 bird flu, what made it become a pandemic? where we can look at the reconstruction of it and find out which residues changed. Let's figure out where it came from. Did it come from Hong Kong? Did it come from Taiwan? Right, let's reconstruct this with a tree. <coughs> we look at things like genome size in dinosaurs, right, which includes birds. Right? And so we can do a phylogeny that includes modern organisms, most of modern birds and extinct dinosaurs, and figure out the dinosaurs evolve a small genome size before they could fly or after they could fly find that many things that fly have tiny genomes. Is it because DNA is heavy? Probably not, right? <laughs> but you can see what the order was. Did they first get a really fast metab metabolic rate and then fly, or you know, was there a lag time? Okay. <coughs> we can get diversity. So you know, birds are a very diverse group, right? It's a wonderful radiation of birds. Well, actually, there's only some birds. So here we have a, a tree that looks at rates of evolution of different clades and find that not all birds are fast, actually just new aves are fast, one, one subset of birds. Right, so now, start, now we can start saying, okay, what about them lets them evolve faster? Do they, because you perch on branches, now you can have a, a faster speciation rate? You know, we don't know, so it's something that you can investigate. <coughs> these are all things you can do with trees. Because no matter what kind of life scientist you, you are, you can use these in some way. How do you get these things? Okay, so here's the overall sort of workflow. Right. So you get sequence data, you build a tree, you calibrate a tree to time, you look at the tree. Okay. I met many people who go through a whole workflow and never actually look at their data. So I had a postdoc who worked for a year on a project and never actually looked to see if his data was aligned properly. It's finding these really cool, weird results. Like, yes, it's because it's all misaligned. And it lined it, all went away. Okay. Look at your data. Look at your trees. <laughs> Now, some people just like the tree, just like to know, you know, fungi are more, really, more closely related to us than they are to plants. That's cool. That's what you get from a tree. But you also use data, other cool data, to look at things like those bark beetle examples or dinosaur genome size. So talk about how to get those data sets using cloud information. And finally, we'll try to answer a question, right? So the goal of this is to do science. So we have a question about, you know, how did bark beetles evolve inbreeding, right? And we use all this stuff just to answer that question. Are there any, any questions about the workflow or anything so far? Okay. Is there any questions coming on Twitter? Let me know too. Hi, Mom. <laughs> okay. So, first, getting sequence data. So, what do you do to get sequence data? Yes, exactly. So, you go to GenBank, right? You can also generate yourself in house. And so, GenBank only ha has like 10% of all, all, all described species are in GenBank. So it's a pretty huge proportion of species, but the one that you care about is not going to be in there, right? You have to go out to the forest and cut through the jungle and get it and take off its DNA, you know, take its DNA and, you know, 
sequence it. But a lot of it's already in GenBank, okay? <coughs> and so it's sort of like a cloud resource, and there's multiple R packages that let you get at GenBank data, okay? So you don't have to go through the web browser to get at it, okay? You can, you can get at it directly from R. <coughs> and actually, lots of online data sources have APIs, right, programming interfaces. And there's many R packages now to get at, that, that, at, get at those data sets. So one group is R OpenSci, it was funded by the Sloan Foundation. And they have interfaces for, you know, Dryad, which we'll talk about, Mendeley, uh, Entree, you know, um, Blast, GBIF, a taxonomic name resolver. Right? Taxonomists are always fighting about names. So you get two data sets that might not agree with names. This will allow you to go take the names, put them into somewhere, resolve them into the same set of taxonomy, bring them back so you can merge species. Okay? So lots of resources there. There's information about getting stuff from literature packages. Right? If you want to get stuff from PLOS, you can do that. If you want to get ORCID information, you can do that. So it's all free, open R stuff. Okay, so that's something. So a lot, of, a lot of the packages I'll talk about today actually come from R OpenSci. Okay. Another source of data. Is there, is there a question? Is there a question or? I was just perplexed as to why you would want to bring reference citations into R. If you want to do a lit, lit analysis. So, for example, when I, when I was applying for this job here. I did an analysis of all, the co of, all the, of all the faculty in my department and showed how networked they all were, and how I like to be networked too. And you know, so like, you know, a plot of this, and people, people loved it. Like, look, that's my name, you know? And, <laughs> you know? and it's great. <laughs> yeah. or, the, or the plot of um, you know, looking at phylogenetics, go through phylogenetics through time, you get data that way. Yeah. Um, you can do phylogenies of languages. You can do phylogenies of text. So, yeah. But good question. Other questions? OK. So <coughs> with GBIF, maybe we'll have, OK, this is COX-1, this is CO-1, this is cytochrome oxidase 1. OK, it's all the same gene. It's all a mitochondrial gene. Right? But it might have different annotations. And so one way to get around that is this cloud service now, the Phyloto browser, and they get a full dump of GenBank and do n by n blast and align these genes and say, OK, I don't care what the, what the names are. Just show me what, what stuff aligns to each other. And <coughs> they also group it, out, group it by taxonomic rank. And so I can go in and look at you know, all, this, all the studies, that, all, the, all the data that relates to turtles and relatives, and they'll be grouped by gene. Right? So cytochrome oxidase 1, CO1. And that has, um, this one has eight sequences in it. This other sequence has 143 different sequences for different species. Okay. So it gives you ready-made data sets for many species without having to do the, the, the alignment and grouping yourself and having to pass, parse the annotations. Okay. And it's something that just runs in the cloud on Mike Sanderson's servers. And I think there's a small cluster for this, actually. And just keeps, you know, finishes one run, start, gets a new load of GenBank, does it again, does it again, does it again. Okay. And so if you're working with a collaborator, you want to know what's the basic phylogeny for a group, you can get at this and pretty quickly go through and make a rudimentary phylogeny. Because <coughs> if you have your data, you can want to build a tree. Right? So yeah, just build a tree. It's not a big deal. Right? Well, um, <coughs> tree space is big. Okay? So here's this is a log scale. And this plot's not from R, it's from Keynote, I'm sorry. Um, but the data from R from R. <coughs> and here's the number of taxa, right? So imagine something that was growing, you know, doubling with a number of taxa, it's this line, right? Increasing tenfold is this purple line. The number of possible trees is this line, this red line, okay? It's going up double factorially, okay? Which means that, <coughs> you know, for just, you know, 50 trees, there are more possible tree topologies than there are atoms in the universe. For just 50 taxa. So I have a tree of 50 taxa, right? So, you know, a quarter of primates. I do a tree of a quarter of primates. There are more possible trees than the number of atoms in the universe. Okay? Now, we think there are at least a million species, right? <laughs> so, tree space is a very, very big, scary place. Okay? 
Um, and so you might think you need some you know, computational power to get at this. Okay? Um, <coughs> and actually, finding the optimal tree is often, depending on the algorithm, uh, depending on the optimality criterion, an NP-complete problem. Okay? So here's an example of one, okay? an another NP-complete problem. Right? If I said to you, OK, I'd like to give $15.05 worth of appetizers. Right? Well, I could say, OK, I want you know, 20 mixed fruit. Well, you can say, tell, that doesn't work. Right? So you can easily verify that's not a solution. How can you find a solution? Has anyone found a solution yet? There's actually at least two. I only remember one of them. I found, found both of them. OK. But if I said to you, OK, how about seven mixed fruits? Ah, it works. Right? So it's easy to verify a solution, but it's, you have to do, uh, it's very hard to have an algorithm that's guaranteed to give you that solution, okay? one that runs in successful amounts of time. Okay? And lots of tree searches are like this, okay? where <coughs> there's no algorithm that's guaranteed to give you the right tree within a certain range of the optimal criterion. Okay? So you have all these heuristic searches, different ways of you know, simulated annealing, different, different search strategies, but they all become computationally hard. Right? And there's not enough time in the age of the universe to actually look at any, every possible tree. You have to do some shortcuts. Okay. So getting a tree is scary. <coughs> so here's a sample tree. Um, this came out you know, five years ago. And it was 13,000 species, okay. which took 32 gigs of RAM, which at the time you know, wasn't common. And now, now you can get that on your desktop. Right? <coughs> but that's just, you know, 13,533 species. And th imagine that search space is basically the size of the campus here. Right? Here's the campus here, mostly athletics, a little few yeah, classrooms. Right? And it's like finding you know, a rubber duck somewhere on campus. That's a search space for 13,533 species. Imagine I add two species. Right? How big would the search, search space get? The entire planet, right? So the ratio of this area to this area is the ratio of the search area for a 13,533 taxon tree and a 13,535 taxon tree. Okay. So again, I mean, this is a very big, scary problem. So what can you do? <coughs> Reduce, reuse, recycle. Right. So once I've built my tree of 13,000 plant species. If you want to do a phylogeny of plants for some question, you know, how does wood evolve, it would be great if you just use my tree. Right? And people thought of this years ago and made something called TreeBase, okay? which is a database of trees. And so what was hoped to happen is that we developed this culture of you must release your tree on TreeBase. Okay? And there's a few R packages, um, TreeBase, and then R Dryad goes with the Dryad now sucks in this information that can get you those trees directly. Okay? <coughs> There's now an NSF project that's about a year and a half old um, that is creating a single unified tree and also lets let you have access to all these trees as well. Okay. So this is coming soon. This all sounds great. However, the state of the art is this. Okay. Who knows what this picture is? Right. This is not a pipe, right? But I'm a greet. Okay. It's not a pipe, it's a picture of a pipe. Okay. And in the world of trees, 96% of trees are pictures of trees in the literature. Only 4% are actually made in a reusable way. So you create a picture, picture of a tree, you get the JPEG, you slap it in your PDF, right? upload it, and then someone else has to, there's actually multiple tools that are called like tree thief and things like that that let you trace a tree and do OCR on the names and try to get the tree out that way. Right? Only 4% of people actually put their tree somewhere useful. Okay. It's like about open science. I mean, we're failing here. Right? Um, <coughs> it's kind of terrifying. Right? And people are trying to fight about it and get it working, but you know, this is the state of the art. Okay? So you might be able to get a tree from someone who publishes well. But if not, you have to build your own. Okay? <coughs> and there are now cloud resources for that. So here's an older NSF project that's still running, the Cypress Science Gateway. Okay. And this is backed by Exceed, which we talked about yesterday. Right? So your taxpayer-funded um, supercomputer. 
right? So you can get access to here with some caveats. Don't be from North Korea. Just imagine the other caveats like that, right? Um, and you get access, and then you can run a variety of tree inference software packages. Okay, and they have things like checkpoint things. So the cluster goes down, they can keep continue from that point, and lots of good resources. And <coughs> it's run a quarter million jobs so far. It's done 5,200 CPU years of compute time. Okay, so it's been running for a long time, and it's very useful for people. Okay, so if you need to build a tree and don't want to, you know, tire your poor laptop, this is one thing you can do. Okay, any questions about this? Yeah. So everyone hear the question? All right. So, so let's mention there's that 13,000 tax on tree. I could either, you know, delete taxa from that tree using a computer to get, you know, a tree of my 70 species, or I can download the GenBank data for those 70 species and build it up. Um, in part, it depends on how good that big tree is. So there are some large trees where so a lot of, a lot of methods we'll talk about in a minute. Branch lengths matter a lot. So you want amount of time between species to be proportional to time on the, on the tree. And for all these big trees, they sort of make that up. Right? So they'll say, OK, I'll fix this node, and then I'll use some sort of null model of Yule branching and make up these other branching times. Right? Um, <coughs> which if you had all the data yourself, you wouldn't have to do that. On the other hand, they might have multiple calibrations. They might have multiple. Fossil dates that say, you know, this node must be, be at least this old, but not older than this, and so forth. That allows them to get a better estimate than you would with your, I don't know what a fossil is, you know, make it a branch length one, right? And so there's a trade off that way. Yeah, I mean, in general, I'd probably use, uh, if you have a kind of big tree made from actual data, I'd probably use that. If it's a super tree, which is a tree stitched together from other trees, I'd be more cautious. Yeah. But, you know, other, other discussion about this? So, oh, tri trivial. I mean, there's a time of getting the data, looking at the data, make sure everything's right. But the actual runtime on even like a laptop is a few days now. So even though it's an NP-complete problem, we'll be able to spend a lot of time with getting the heuristics to work really well, um, making the likelihood calculation work very, very efficiently. And so it's actually feasible for lots of things. Right, so we think that, I mean, so there's a few wrinkles. So we often think there's like the one true tree, right? So like, you know, our, we're, we're, so chimps and monobos are each closest relatives, and then they're sister to us, right? We know that's, that's true. But in some cases, we, there's hybridization in gene flows. It might not be a single true tree. So you might disagree for that reason. So you have a tree based, based on mitochondria, which has a different history than the nuclear tree. Um, there's also other issues with, um, if rates change over time, methods perform badly in certain ways. And so what sometimes people do is what's called breaking up long branches. If you have a branch that has a long time without species coming off of it, if you can find species that branch at that point, you can help infer multiple changes better. And so it's possible that a large tree would do better at that sort of religion. So there's fights. There's also fights about um, statistical approach, right? Bayesian versus distance versus likelihood versus parsimony. And you know, people have fought and almost died over these things. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh huh. Not really. So the space of trees I, I was talking about was the number of topologies, right? right? So. A network graph with no articulations that had that where branch lines don't matter, but what, the, what those things do that with the calibrations, that's all about getting the branch lengths right. So what people sometimes do is do it as a two-step process: first get the topology with initial branch lengths, and then stretch the tree such that it becomes a clock-like tree based on those calibrations. But you can also do it jointly, 
in which case the calibrations might actually help inform the tree structure. Yeah. Other questions? Yep. Um, again, by annoying some people and not other people, right? right? Um, yeah. Can I just add one other yeah. thing? Which is Here, take, take, take the mic. Oh, sorry. Just a couple of things to watch out for. Is this on? It's, it's going to the web, right. I think. Uh, one is polytomy. So sometimes these super trees will have unresolved locations, and that can crash whatever your inference method is that you want to do. So you've got to watch out for that. So just define. So we think that the way speciation happens is one species becoming two. Right, this is the simplest explanation. So your species, mountain range pops up. Okay, now this half becomes one species, this half becomes the other species. Right, and then after a while, they can't interbreed anymore. And so what happens with phylogenetics, if we don't know what the resolution is, we'll say, okay, we'll just call it as one becoming three. And it could be A and B becoming a clade, or B and C becoming a clade, or A and C. We don't know which it is. We just smash them together, call it polytomy. Right? But a lot of methods are hard-coded to assume it's a bifurcating tree, one to two. Oftentimes the megatrees will be sort of genus level or whatever, or they'll have just representatives from, so they'll have the backbone tree, but they won't have the details of you know, all the most recent species. And so that's important, and then you have to stitch them together or something like that, or there's other methods. So, and then if you want to have uncertainty in trees, there's a whole set of stuff for that too. So. Yeah, could you imagine, I mean, given the search space and finite data, I mean, there's lots of uncertainty in these trees, and there's ways of incorporating that. Other questions? OK. <coughs> now, calibrating a tree to time. Something you can do here is you can talk to a paleontologist who knows something and um, get ages for your groups. Because we often will look up something and say, OK, this, this fossil is from Cretaceous. OK, in my coloring book here, it says Cretaceous goes from here to here. Let's call it midpoint. And Fossil tell does know a lot more than that, right? They get much more. But they also know that there's significant uncertainty, too. So you talk to a paleontologist that can say, okay, this goes here, and with this range, okay? Oftentimes, putting the t fossil on the tree is hard, right? I found a beetle. Where does the beetle go on the tree of insects? Is it within the clade of extant beetles? Is it sister to extant beetles? Okay, so there's issues like that. So dating a tree can be hard. Um, one thing you could possibly do, <coughs> This should, should have been an animation. Um, is this thing called Time Tree, which, which has, they've gone out and gotten, I think it's 2,700 different calibrated trees, okay? And put them all into one database. And so then you can enter in, you know, dog and cat, and it'll tell you across all these trees when the dog and cat diverge, okay? So you get all this information from other studies that presumably were well done and get some uncertainty in that. Okay, there's a risk of doing a sort of a game of telephone where you use, you use their dates and then you put your database, your trees in the database and someone else uses yours, but it's better than nothing, right? Um, one problem with this though, and this should have popped up later, is that <coughs> in terms of a cloud resource, look, don't touch. Um, you can't write an automated, you're not allowed to write an automated script to, to pull that data down. I mean, you could, it's very feasible to scrape it, but you're not allowed to, and apparently they will block your IP, okay? Um, and you also can't download the raw database. So it's one of those things where it's good for if you want to say to your niece, you know, oh, how close are we related to dog? Let's see, human dog. Oh, it's, you know, 30 million years. It's good for that, but for calibration, it's, it can be difficult if you want to scale it. That's, that's what the iPhone app is for. <laughs> oh, yeah they, have, yeah, they have an iPhone app, an iPad app, so a, a poster. App, but, yeah. <laughs> um, there's another one, it's a more open one called Date Life that's just starting out. And there they allow you to, well, we allow you to, um, so conflict of interest now, to scrape everything, um, download the full data set, download the R code. The big problem here is there's very few trees. This has like maybe 30 trees or so, compared to 2,700 trees, right? So there's a trade-off between great coverage but closed and awful coverage but open, right? And you could try, I mean, you could, you could try adding trees to here, okay? And there's also sorts of calibration too. And calibration matters because a lot of questions are about rates of evolution, right? So we care about do birds speciate or go extinct, go speciate faster or go extinct slower than crocodilians? Right? Well, part of it matters like how, lo how old are those two groups, right? It's all about the time. Okay, so looking at trees, all right. 
So we talked about ggplot2 today, right? So we should be able to just look at a tree, right? Actually, it's very hard to even do that in this domain. Okay. So <laughs> here we have our tree. There's 13,533 <coughs> names, right? Strings of text. Okay. Your fancy HDTV, right? Has 1,920 pixels, right? How many you know bits of text you fit per pixel? Right. You're not going to put you know 10 words per pixel on on your HDTV. Um, <coughs> people tile together computer monitors, right? And so you can have a you know, high resolution computer monitor and tile those together. Okay? Again, it doesn't scale ter terribly well, right? And actually, this is one of the, that's still kind of the state of the art, right? High resolution, easily extendable, cheap. Okay? <laughs> so here's one of the postdocs at Nimbus when he was a grad student, and he sort of hand built this tree from all the days with Jeremy Beaulieu. And then put it on the wall, and then could like check it out. Okay, and it's important because you know we we recently published a paper that had a tree of 50,000 species in it, right? And <coughs> we know that from many many data sets that one group called Amborella, one one species is sister to all other angiosperm species. Right? So as angiosperms evolved, the speciation event, one went and became Amborella. One went and became everything else, right? And there's lots of evidence for this. <coughs> And on our tree, if you look at it carefully, up oh, umbrella is not actually sister to everything else. Right? So, yeah, okay. So what could we have done? We could have done a con you know we could have done a constrained analysis and said, okay, we know it must be that way, so let's force it to be that way. Because the automated doesn't matter for our analyses. Okay, but even when we know that, unless you can look at the tree. Okay. <coughs> and this becomes a, a big deal. And <coughs> there are various ways to, to deal with this. So here's one of them that came out recently. I'm not on this at all. There's this is something that's out called OneZoom. And so it works the way Google Maps do. Right? So if you're familiar with Google Maps, you zoom in and it loads more and more detailed tiles, and you zoom back out. Okay? This works the same sort of way. We can zoom in, so it's actually revealing more data and everything, and then zoom back out. And a lot of, there are a lot of now tree viewers like this that sort of dynamically scale and compress. Okay? Which can be good for something. Here we can say, okay, you know, if monotremes were a bad place relative to marsupials, we could pick that out. But also we can zoom in and say, okay, is the spiny anterior where it really should be? And get that information. All right. Any questions about this? Yeah? What does the tree actually look like? Oh, the data look like. Yeah, so there is, of course, multiple data formats. Um, the most basic is Newick which is named after Newark Seafood Restaurant in New Hampshire. Because <laughs> uh, there was an evolution meeting there, and a bunch of the, like, you know, the five people who were building phylogenetic software said, let's go out and decide on this standard. So they went out and decided on the Newark standard. And the Newark standard is just a series of, so a tree, so a tree like this, um, Bonobo, chimp, human, gorilla, right? One way of looking at it is like as a series of nestings, right? So you can look at, think of it looking at it from above, and I have bonobo, chimp, and then bonobo, chimp, human, and then bonobo, chimp, human, gorilla, right? And all new standard is. Parentheses, right, <laughs> with commas. Okay, so it's very simple. It's, it's very efficient. Um, <coughs> you can see some problems with it, though. So, is this tree the same as this tree? If I switch these, well, yes, it is. I can rotate trees in the nodes. But if I'm doing some sort of string matching, it has to be to take that into account, right? Um, and it's been hacked to add metadata. So, if I want to say, you know, how long is this branch? Okay, let's say this is 14 million years. Right? I can add colon, colon, 14. Okay? And it's been hacked with other ways, too. So that's sort of the basic tree structure. Um, within code, you often do you know, parent, child, sibling relationships. Or sometimes there will be a matrix that shows parent, offspring relationships on a tree. Right? So they'll show you know, this node has these two descendants, this node has these two descendants. Different structures. Other questions about this? And of course, now there are other standards, too. There's um, an XML version that's you know, long. There's a JSON version. Um, 
Actually, there's competing XML versions. So, yeah. So there's different standards evolving. Other questions? Okay. <coughs> All right. So now we have our tree. We look at our tree. It looks okay. Now we want to actually answer our questions. We have to get get cool data. Okay. And it's a wonderful time now because at one point you have to go out and you know if you want to figure out where plants are, you have to go out and like look at each plant or go to the herbarium, look at the sheet, and say, okay, you are in you know you know Knox County, Tennessee. Where's that? Okay, let's go to the map, right? But now we have we're digitizing all this information. Okay. So for example, GBIF, right? 440 million occurrences, 1.4 million species. Okay. And our open sci folks have made an interface to pull that data down. Okay. So you, you know, pull the data down from the cloud, you have to clean it up, right? Because sometimes people will say, we'll put down as a record where, it's, where the actual specimen is rather than where you found it. So we found it, we put it in Harvard's herbarium, so it's now in Harvard's herbarium. Well, it was found in China, I care about that it was in China. Right? So you filter that sort of thing. Um, and you get the same thing with GenBank and all these data sets, all these big databases have things you have to clean up. Right? But once you do that, it's a great resource. Okay? Um, <coughs> Dryad. Who's put something on Dryad? Okay, good. At some point, all of you will. Right? Well, because journals are requiring it. Right? So why did tree base fail? Why don't people deposit their trees? Well, they're like, it wouldn't be swell, guys, if we put our trees together? Like, yeah, it's swell, but I'm busy. Right? With Dryad, if you submit to systematic biology, you will put things on Dryad. Okay? Or you will not get published. Okay? And so it's sort of a, a stick model. Okay. There's carrots too. If you, pu if you publish your data, you get more citations, you know, your work's more useful to people, you're a better scientist, right? But also, otherwise you won't get published, so you do it. Okay? <coughs> and so there's our interfaces to all this data that you can download. Right? And so that, like in you know, this one paper here, you know, seventeen thousand downloads for this paper. So this paper's data, just the data alone. Okay. Um, so it's it's good to be Cody. Yeah. Or that our dry had figured out how to basically create stuff out of whatever funky format people put stuff up. Yes, yeah, so I'm not I'm not sure what the R open side like interface to this, whether if it's like Excel versus tab delimited text, does it merge it properly? I don't think it does yet. Yeah. Um yeah. Tom was addressing it in R so that the he'll recompile it in this format. Oh cool. Yeah. Are you, are you one of the group? Sort of. OK. I'm sort of now, too. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a group of like, it's a, a core of like four young, eager scientists, and they just keep like glomming on. And let's, let's all work together. So that's great. But, yeah. Uh, is there another question in the back? Or? No, just cheer. OK. All right. Um, those will be PaleoDB, right? So why are the continents funny? Well, it's because that's where they were in the Cretaceous, right? <coughs> and this has fossil records going back. So you say, okay, where did T. Rex occur? Okay, and you can use that for information. Okay, and this is a few of the available data sets out there. There's tons of data about. Um, uh, is there a question? Oh, this is PaleoDB, and now they're showing. So you can plot on. So they have all the records, and you can plot the records on a map of like Cretaceous continental continental position. Yeah. And there's a, there's a schism with the PaleoDB where the person who developed it, there was a fork, and there's competing groups now. And yeah, it's messy, and people fight over data because data is hard to get. Right? But for us, data is easy to get now. And we can go and just download it using our little R scripts. Okay? Do make sure you, you, you give credit to those who you know, went out in the field and chopped down a tree and measured its diameter right, while being bitten by mosquitoes. But you know, for us, we can get these huge data sets now. Okay? <coughs> and the data sets about, um, from, you know, from information about where plants live, we can figure out, you know, information about their uh, re elevation or rainfall they're exposed to, other animals in the environment. Okay, so there's lots and lots of data. We have data about genome size, plant seed size, um, litter size in mammals. Okay. All these data sets are available. Okay, you just have to go and get them. And there's more and more of a trend of, of publishing them to the 
to, to online, and then we can incorporate them into our workflows in R. Any questions about data sources? Okay. And finally, we can now answer our question finally. Right, so we have our tree, we have our cool data, now we can put them together into a cool method and answer a question. You know, what did long-extinct frogs sound like? Did dinosaurs have small genomes? Okay. And so in R, there's actually a task view. So who's, who's seen a task view before? Okay, about half of you. Okay, so a task view is a curated set of packages in R. There can be, for example, all the packages that deal with high-performance computing. We talked about that yesterday. As you want to say, okay, I want to put things on a cluster or something. What do I do? What's out there? And so you can try Googling CRAN, like R HPC. You know, it won't work. But if you go to a task view, you can see what someone in the field has, has organized as, here's all the methods, here's a little description about them. If you want to install them all at once, all the packages, you can. Um, library CTV, install packages, it's, it's install views, high performance computing, or file genetics. So here's one for file genetics that has a you know, description of different approaches, looking at ancestral states, looking at divergence times, and so forth. And then here you see some of the packages in R that deal with phylogenies. Okay. This is a lot of them. Okay. And then you can bring them to your workflows. And right now, for that part, if you want to, if you want to do it on the cloud, it's, it's mostly up to you, not, not entirely. So there's iPlant, for example, <coughs> and this is for enabling plant science, but they don't check to see that you have plants. You could do mammals, and they like, okay, sure, mammals, whatever. Okay, and you can load your data, and they can do, it's like the Cypress Discovery, it's like the Cypress Science Gateway in some ways. Okay, you upload your data, and you can run analyses. iPlant has more of the comparative methods things. So you have used Geiger in the past, Geiger's up there. <laughs> if you have some tool that you want to use, there's actually a way for the community to, to add things to that resource. Okay, so you can add things, and then it will run on high-performance computing servers in, I think it's Texas now, um, and get your analyses back. Okay, so, and again, it's free. It's looking for the taxpayers. Right? Yeah? Actually, some of the back end on the iPlan is actually done in R, not all of it. Okay. Um, there's now actually an R interface to iPlan too. So if you want to get it at it from R, once you get the login credentials, you can do that. Okay. So you can add it to your regular workflow. Okay. Um, and another NSF funded thing that's about a year and a half old is this Arbor thing, which again I'm not involved in, but looks promising. Where we'll have workflows you can put together and will run on HPC software, some, uh, HPC resources somewhere. And there's Luke Harmon and colleagues. Okay, and that should be out in the next year or so. Okay, so, so that's some of the existing packages for answering questions in R. Um, for a lot of it though, it still makes sense that you do it on your own hardware or put it on Amazon or something like that and use the basic packages. Okay. Um, <coughs> well, also one caveat about the comparative methods packages. So we talked about how, you know, for tree inference, we're good at memorizing, at minimizing speed, at maximizing speed, at doing likely calculations efficiently, not having too much memory. Okay? For the comparative method stuff, like figuring out the ancestral state, that's written by biologists like me, right? Who often are just sort of trying to get their method into pa a package and get it out and publish it. Okay? It's not well optimized. You know, it hasn't been R prof at all. Okay? <coughs> might not even been tested at all, might not even work properly. So um, for a while, like, so one of the big packages is Geiger, which is great and useful, right? Its example file for one of its analyses, you actually get the wrong, you, you actually get an, an estimate of a value that was not the MLE, okay? Because they had these fixed hard limits, and if you just expose, change the limits, you actually find the MLE, the MLE was like 22, but you're gonna get there because it's hard-coded 20 limit. Um, <coughs> another program called, rate, called a Ape will give you negative rate estimates. What's the rate of going from A to C? Negative five. What? Um, which is something now that's been fixed, but you get, get that sort of thing a lot in these packages. And so something worth considering, you know, it, this should be an easy search, but oftentimes it doesn't work well. So you have to, you know, as a user, be careful and cautious. Yeah? So 
So for the tree formats, there's been, but there's been some stuff. But in the data in general, uh, yeah. Not that I know of. A anyone else know of any potential attempt to standardize formats? <laughs> yeah. There's some good conversion programs for certain things. So that's crucial to know about. So what's the read sequence and what's the sequences? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there's actually a task view that lists all the interfaces from R to all these resources, which not just the R open side people, but just anyone in general. So you look at that. Um, a more general database, I'm not sure of anything like that. I mean, that's the task view or like for apply with the learning or something like that. Oh, yes, no, but it's, this is a task view for, um, I think, R with scraping, scraping HTML or what's, what? Web technologies. Yes, yeah, web technologies. Right, so it's just R interfacing to other resources on the web. Yeah, so that's available too. I'll add that link to the set. Yep, so that, that first slide that had the Brown and Merritt Info tutorials uh, Philo Cloud has all these links, has links to everything. <coughs> and it's on Twitter, and I'll also put it on the WordPress site, so you'll get it all. Yep. Okay, so just going back to learning objectives, right? So Phylogenetics is awesome, you should all know that now, right? Um, so the pitfalls of the tree size and also some of the bad programming at times. Um, many, many resources available. Okay, and do use them. Okay, the cloud's out there. Pa taxpayers are paying for it. Use it until you need to do something else, and then build your own. All right. Any general questions about this? Anyone have use cases they want to talk about? Something that you wanted to do that you can't for some reason? And if so, Nick will code a solution for you. <laughs> Neighbor joining or distance or yeah, and like you know, how do you uh, validate that the alignment is good? I mean, there's just all these assumptions in there. Um, yep. So I don't know. I just wanted to get opinions about how valid they are and what the best way is to do them. Yeah. So for alignments, I mean, it's good to use one of the more recent alignment programs like MAFT or Muscle rather than Clustal. I mean, Clustal, if you read the papers describing it, it was originally for, like, to help you out, and then you go in and manually say, oh, let's fix this region, right? Um, and they've done tests, and the later ones work better. So that's one thing to look at. Um, for tree inference, um, so we know that distance measures can, can perform poorly in some cases. Um, so there's this Felsenstein zone. Who's heard of that? OK, a few of you, right? So the paper <coughs> back in the 80s, was it? Yeah. yeah. Um, showing that some tree optimality criteria would off, would, could be misled by the good way of thinking of like heterogeneity and branch lengths, actually more subtle than that. But if you have a tree like that, where branch length is proportional to amount of change, and it could be mistakenly reconstructed as okay, due to similar changes happening by chance on these branches. And so neighbor joining has an issue with that. Okay. Um, parsimony has an issue with that. Likelihood, if you have the correct model, does not. It's a big if, though. This, I mean, life is very complex. You know, a six-parameter model is probably not sufficient to fit at all. Right, um, <coughs> but you know, likely approaches would be better than sort of neighbor joining in that case. And you can use RaxML and it will f or um, Garley, and it'll finish in you know a, f hour, a few hours, maybe a day. So I do that. Yeah. So kind of off of that, and one of your opinions, have you seen these? So there are so for macologists, there are these programs that you can try to enter the names of tax, and it'll query and CGI and go through the any services lab has one. Mm -hmm. I don't know that one. It's kind of amazing. So I'm 
wondering, but it, it's one of those things I feel like it's too good to be true. Have you seen these kind of workflows where basically they're all the pearl is happening sort of behind the box? Yeah, there's, um, is it Futility? Is that the name of, it, of Steve? Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not Futility. The, uh, yeah, the, the, the same group had Futility. What's the one Jeremy and Steven are on? Can you Google it? Yeah, there's another one that's like that that has, I think it's Python backed, where you get a sample of GenBank. And you say, okay, I want, I want these seven genes right. for this group of taxa. Yeah, this is what, this is what made you just go in the apron and set this up well. And yeah. I whether, do you think that's kind of a hack? Do you think that, I mean, if it was that simple, would phylogenesis not exist? Like, if I could, if I could put well, in. We, well, phylogenesis shouldn't, shouldn't exist. Do you know what that means? No, but I mean. If I could put in the names of seven taxa and in 12 minutes, yeah, I mean, Some hundreds and thousands of people have spent their lives developing this whole thing, and then like we can write a Python script that'll do it. Like that, that makes me worry. Right. I mean, at some point, like we should be able to just go and like download the data from somewhere, right? Like right. you don't like reinfer like, oh, so where's North America again? Oh no, just look at a map, right. right? And so we should be doing that for life soon. But yeah, you're right. A lot of these are um, inferring the tree in real time. Uh, yeah, and it does make you worried. I mean, and, and there's stuff where can you find it yet? Nick? I'm looking at Jeremy's website. Look at Stephen Smith's website. I can't believe I can't, I can't remember it. Um, it's another like, self deprecating name. Um, <coughs> but yeah, it, it goes through a series of alignment steps and it can throw out things that aren't well aligned and things like that. And I think it's good for a fast pa first pass, right. but you probably do want to look at your data, look at the alignments, and yeah. Um, Is flawed? Flawed, that's it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of, uh, yeah. So a lot of the, yeah, this is a utility project. So this is a thing for making giant trees. And so a lot of the big trees you see are made with this pipeline, right? But it can also be hard to install and use. But, yeah, but I mean, it, probably for a first pass, it's not bad. So like that 50,000 tax on tree I was talking about was made with that pipeline, but with multiple constraints. Not as many constraints as you might need, but still with constraints. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions about this? It always surprises me, actually, when people go out in the field and like, I have studied these 20 plants to death, and I love them. I've named them all Bob and Mary. Okay, do you have a tree for them? Well, no. Well, I mean, just get the leaves, have them send them to a friend to sequence, right? I mean, it's not hard to get a basic tree now. So if you have a question like that, you can go and, you know, infer a tree. Yeah. Other questions about this domain or about these resources? Dating? Data cleaning. Oh, data cleaning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, this phylogenetic dating. Yeah. Long branch attraction, we call it. No. Um, <laughs> so for data cleaning, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, for data cleaning, there's some stuff with the taxonomic matching, right? So that can help a lot. And then other than that, Google has something, I forget what it's called, but Google had, uh, had one thing that could help clean up data. I'm not sure if it's any good. It was one of the things that they, they bought a company that could do it, and then it was still helped, it's still in Google, but I'm not sure if it's live at all. Um, people who have workflows, so like for GBIF data, people who do it a lot have things that go through and say, okay, are you at a herbarium? Toss out that data. Um, are you in the middle of the ocean and you're a cactus? Toss out the data. And so there's things like that. Um, but as a general tool, I don't know of anything. Yeah, does anyone else know of any sort of data clean? Yeah. Is that still live? Yeah, it's still live. I don't think anyone has data. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's been, I forget the new name, but it's been since someone working on it accidentally, and now. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Open refined. Open refined. Is it been open sourced? Uh, it's free, open source, powerful tool for working with messy data. Good. So I'm making an R front end. <laughs> okay, so that could be good to look at. Yeah, because a lot of things when you're dealing at this scale, it'll be some weird thing, which is another reason to look at, look at your data. You find, oh wait, that cactus is in the ocean. I should throw that out. But if you just ran through and didn't actually map it, you might not say, oh wait, they switched the sign and the longitude. Right. So. Yeah. Often they're very difficult to fix errors, right? Because it should be 
one person sees that it's encrypted, you can stop it, right? Yeah. Or at least flag it so that people can auto delete problematic records. But for God knows what reason, it seems impossible to, to undo the human agenda. Yep. It's up to the original authors to fix it. And, and uh, I don't know. If you could wave a magic wand, it would be a better way. But it's hard. So you, you really got to be careful. You can, almost everything at some level of error is encrypted. Yeah. Yep. Identifying orthologs and paralogs, and you can contamination. Results that seemed really, you know, amazing and different than what was previously published. You can really triple check it because you could have just screwed something up. Yeah. Or it's a science paper. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that does happen. <laughs> Yes, so there's tax eyes, which is an our open si our open sci thing. Um, iPlant has one that's just for plants. There's actually also another one called Taxosaurus um, that came out of a Philomatic working group, a hack hackathon thing that queries multiple name resolvers, and you can pick which one you want. Or you know, is some talk about having it so it picks the one for you. Okay, and someone can do things like if you do Rosa Rugosu rather than Rugosa, it'll say, "Oh, it's name, name spelled wrong." Okay, let's change that. Some um, there's also issues with like people changing genera. So Anolis, who's sort of Anolis lizards, right? The big radiation. Well, someone came through and split them into eight genera, right? And the way taxonomy works, that's valid. But so does having them in one genus. So depending on which camp you fall in, you have eight genera of them and you split them up, or one. So if you're looking at records of, you know, host of which plants they're on, you might not know it's the same thing, right? But these names, name resolvers can, fi can figure that out sometimes. Yeah. Good. Other questions about this? One of the reasons to use phylogenies is to control for non-dependence. This was the boring reason, right? But if we're looking at, you know, how many times do things with four legs have hair? Well, it hasn't been, hasn't been independent of all of multiple times, right? I mean, tetrapods rose, and then once they became mammals and had hair. That's, you know, two changes. And so if you count them as 4,000 changes, you get the wrong answer. And so phylogenetics helps with that, too. It's not sexy, but you have to do it anytime you deal with more than two species. So another reason. The ones that, ones that incorporate trees or not, you mean, or? Just, just uh, like inferring things like community assemblies without using phylogeny. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to look at the history. The phylogenies give you that information about history. I think some of the cruder measures, like are these as the, these groups over dispersed or under dispersed? You know, people have shown that you know Janine Kavanagh Bears and others have shown that there's multiple multiple processes that can lead to the same pattern. Right, so if you just look at the pattern alone, you know, oh, okay, well, it happens just as much here. You have ginkgo here. You don't have a ginkgo. That's driving the over dispersion, under dispersion thing, right? So it's worth again l worth looking at, and digging into it in more detail. But the first pass and give you some information. Yeah, I mean, I, I always, I'm always concerned with because there are so many different methods you can use to construct a phylogeny in the first place. Um, your choice of those methods. I wonder how important your choice of you know this pipeline is. Yeah, so way back when people were first doing trees for like comparative methods, there were studies about like if you don't know a tree, you know, how much of it can you make up or randomize and you know, how robust is it to errors in the tree. And so for like, things like independent contrast where you're looking at two, this, two uh, continuous traits on the tree, it's fairly robust to tree errors. Um, and so you probably use any pipeline to be okay. Other things are based more on rates of evolution it hasn't been examined yet, but I imagine it could be affected by it. People have looked at things like um, speciation processes, right? And they do it on trees that have made up branch lines according to a particular speciation model. And if you find that same speciation model again, well, yeah, maybe that's what the actual truth is. Maybe you just that's just what you, how you made your tree, stuff like that. But you know, in general with ecology, you can also do like you know Akike tests and say, okay, is is the data better? Is it the model better with or without the tree, or with the transformation of the tree? As rather than doing some a priori thing about, oh, I don't look, look at trees, or I always use trees, you can actually let the data tell you. So, yeah. Uh, it's break time. I guess we should have some questions. Yeah, I can answer some questions during break.
All right, thank you all.